Hello, this is uh, Robert McMullen. I'm a psychiatrist. I've been in practice for over three decades, almost solely with psychopharmacology, but for the f past 10 years or 11 years, I've been doing TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, I went to uh, Georgetown Medical School, which I thought was a wonderful place. And I did my residency at Columbia Presbyterian, which is also a great place. Now the question is, does TMS cause insomnia? And this question has been asked quite a few times. Now my basic answer would be to say no. But if you had TMS and you developed insomnia, I would say it's related. Now, there's two main possible reasons. And in medicine, whenever you come up with a reason, 10 years later, it turns out that's not the real reason. But, but the, the main two reasons would be that antidepressants are stimulating. And sometimes TMS is too. So, it seems logical that to get out of depression, a stimulating effect would be good, that it would get people moving, bring them up. And that seems to be what happens. In TMS, you see this especially frequently in people who are a little bipolar or a lot bipolar. When you treat them with the standard treatment of left excitatory treatment, it's like giving them a stimulant like dexedrine, dextroamphetamine, or Ritalin, methylphenidate, or worse yet, like a standard antidepressant that could make them cycle. And it can stimulate them and make them feel irritable and hyper and excessively angry that same afternoon, or it could cause them to be high for a couple of days. One person I've treated for maybe 30 years who's done extraordinarily well on TMS becomes very activated on the left excitatory. I started doing this with him about 10 years ago, and I should not have in retrospect, I should have done right inhibitory, but I didn't understand everything about TMS back then. And it was advocated to use this left excitatory in people even if they were a bit bipolar. And with him, it sometimes excites him so that he's agitated and more hyper for a few days and then he'll come down and be at a better level than he'd been in months. The last time I believe he, he became very agitated and irritable for two days, then went into a few days of depression and then came to a steady state of being essentially euthymic, and he hadn't been that good in months. I think we should do him with right-sided inhibitory treatment, but there's been a general reluctance on everybody's part since it's, this has worked so well. I frequently like to do both sides. I like to do an inhibitory and on the right and an excitatory on the left because they both help depression and it seems that it works better that way. Now, people that are atypical, have atypical depression, which is really common, uh, are in a sense slightly bipolar, so they may be a little bit more likely to have this stimulating effect. And atypical depression is people who have a tendency to oversleep when they're depressed, sleep 10, 12 hours or even more, uh, tend to have hyperphagia, an increased appetite, and eat a lot when depressed, 
and maybe it just comes out with a tendency to carbohydrate craving and they tend to be rejection sensitive so that if uh, a friend of mine or a teacher who I somewhat respect gets angry at me I made a little mistake and they're just a little angry you know it's not, not a big deal but it devastates me and for the whole evening I'm thinking about it it kind of ruins my day or if uh, I have a romantic disappointment then I'm just uh, devastated for weeks I might go to bed for two or three weeks and just want to sleep and just become very depressed that, so that rejection sensitivity hyperphagia and hypersomnia oversleeping those people often are in the spectrum of being slightly bipolar and so they probably have a little bit more of this uh, stimulating effect now it could also be that the person with the depression is uh, having hypersomnia to some degree and is oversleeping and the TMS is beginning to have its benefit and it's knocking out the hypersomnia and now the person's having some insomnia it's hard it's hard to tell but in any case it's a minor problem and uh, one should uh, take a very short-acting benzodiazepine or other sleeping pill if this occurs you don't want to take a benzodiazepine before the TMS because the benzodiazepine reduces the plasticity of the brain it reduces the ability of the brain to change and adapt whereas stimulants like dexedrine and Ritalin methylphenidate they probably increase plasticity and there was one study that showed this and if you use a very short acting benzodiazepine like medication like Sonata would be the very best or Halcyon Triazolam or maybe uh, Xanax or Ambien are relatively short acting or maybe use something that's not a benzodiazepine use um, Neurontin which is gabapentin which probably has no negative effect on plasticity and is very short acting anyway but I, I, I would get around the problem that way the main thing is to come out of the depression now one interesting study was uh, was was done in or published in 2018 just this last year by uh, Zhuang Huang H-U-A-N-G in uh, in Beijing and what he did was stimulate a different area that than we usually stimulate and it's called uh, P4 on the 1020 EEG EEG leads and it's in the parietal area and he did an inhibitory treatment there uh, doing 1500 pulses one pulse per second and he did it at only 90 percent of the motor threshold and with 10 days of treatment these people with generalized anxiety disorder and insomnia their insomnia improved and their generalized anxiety disorder improved and they improved separately it didn't come out that the people with the most improvement on the GAD also had the most improvement on the insomnia they they might improve a lot on both or they might improve on one or the other but there didn't seem to be a relationship now the interesting thing was he only did 90 percent of MT and I, I'm not sure why that was something that was commonly done uh, when I started uh, 10 years ago but as the head of uh, TMS at Harvard says uh, who's Alvaro Pasquale who's the first fellow who published on this he said the one Hertz the one pulse per second is inhibitory because it's one pulse per second 
uh, and the amount of intensity doesn't really have anything to do with it. So that means that if you give 120% of MT, which is what you do with excitatory on the left, if you gave 120% on the right of the inhibitory treatment, you may get more inhibition because you're reaching deeper, you're reaching a broader area. So it is very likely that if, if one used a higher MT, that one would have a, uh, a bigger effect, a better effect for sleep and generalized anxiety. When I was at this conference in Tokyo in uh, November 2018, a couple of months ago, I gave a talk on TMS, and it was very interesting that a old uh, psychiatrist from uh, Russia was there, and he gave a talk on his treatment of people with TMS, and uh, he used 90% of MT, whereas we use 120%. And his other parameters might have been less than what we do. Now, he had some positive results, and he went over in detail all the different results, but they weren't very dramatic results. They were statistically significant, but it wasn't putting a large number of people into a completely normal mood into euthymia. And uh, none of us really pushed him too much on that because we didn't want to embarrass him. But he seemed a little bit aware that he, he could have gone higher and should have. Anyway, I'm Robert McMullen. So, so, so the insomnia is just temporary, what caused Oh, yeah, OK. In, in summary, if, uh, if the TMS is causing the insomnia for whatever reason, it should only be temporary. The interesting thing about TMS is it seems almost impossible to harm anyone. If you do the TMS in the wrong place and with the wrong parameters, the wrong type of pulses, Nothing happens. The patient doesn't get worse. It's just that it doesn't help. It seems that the only way you can, well, maybe there's two ways you can make people worse. Uh, one is to treat them on the motor strip with very high intensity, excited to, you could induce a seizure, although that's not permanent either because they just have a seizure and they only have it while they're sitting in the chair, they're not driving the car. And uh, the other thing is with bipolar people, especially bipolar one, manic depression, you could set off their illness and make them cycle more. And I had at least one person I did that early on, and I really made an error in, in, in continuing 10 years ago. Uh, but it seems like even if you do that and have that bad outcome, as long as you just stop the TMS right then, after one treatment or, or whenever, the treat, whenever it occurs that they start to cycle, that uh, it's very retrievable. And uh, they're not going on into a uh, constant cycling and a, and a constant problem for months or a year. One of the problems with the antidepressants, especially the serotonin medicines, the SSRIs, like Prozac, Zoloft, Celexa, Effexor, Effexor, and Cymbalta may be the worst, and the old tricyclics, is if they flip people into a high, they may stay there, or they may stay cycling. So they've been chronically depressed for you know, quite a long while. You put them on one of these medicines, and after a while, they flip into a high, and then they might start cycling and have more depressions in the next year than if they had never been given an antidepressant. And more and more of us are feeling a little negative about the serotonin medications because they poop out after time, sometimes after a couple months, but sometimes not until 10 or 20 years. But once they poop out, 
they won't work again. And you use any other one and they won't work. And then it seems like it's caused the patient to have more treatment resistant depression and maybe worse depression than they would have without them. I have a lady recently, I realized that she was really consistently moderately depressed and not functioning and when her husband's friends came to town and he couldn't go out with them, she took them around the city and her mood lifted to normal for two days. And that's atypical depression, that you, your mood can... And uh, I felt, you know, this serotonin medicine, Celexa, or I believe it was, I'm not sure, citalopram, is, is worse for her than nothing. And it was very difficult to come off. It took her a while. And then she had brain zaps, these electrical shocks in her brain. It was, it was a nightmare for a few weeks. But when the withdrawal was over, She's in a normal mood and on no medication. It's just astonishing. The medicine was making her worse. If, if we need to use something in the future, we'll use, if she starts to have some depression again, we'll use TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, or Wellbutrin, bupropion, or an MAO inhibitor, or there's also various nutritional things like NAC and AC and inositol and fish oil and thyroid hormone and, and low-dose lithium and low-dose lamictal. There, there's quite a few things that you can use that will not cycle people and they actually have less side effects than the standard things that are labeled antidepressants. One last thing. Sandy Glassman of Columbia, a great researcher who's deceased, he used to tell people, you know, these medicines don't know what we call them. They just do what they do. So uh, the things that we label antidepressants, that's what everybody wants. They want it because it's called an antidepressant. But low-dose lithium is an antidepressant. Lamotrigine, lamictal is an antidepressant. Thyroid, sometimes even in low doses, is an antidepressant. Uh, statins for cholesterol, they're antidepressants, especially the uh, lipid-soluble ones and the ones that are very high potency, like Lipitor atorvastatin. That's both high potency and lipid-soluble. And they definitely have a great antidepressant effect. Anyway, this is Robert McMullen. I'm a psychiatrist uh, specializing in TMS and psychopharmacology. And thank you for listening.